<clears throat> Amen. Right where we're there in Hebrews chapter number 4. And uh, tonight we are continuing through our Declaring Doctrine uh, series. And this is now uh, week 6 in this series. And honestly, we're probably going to have like 25 weeks in this series to get all of the major doctrines. Uh, I hope that's okay with you, uh, that we study the Bible together and learn doctrine. If you remember, we started with a sermon on the importance of doctrine, then we talked about the doctrine of revelation. We've now uh, spent several weeks, in fact, this is one, two, three, this is a fourth week on the doctrine of the Word of God. And if you remember, we started with the sermon about the doctrine of the Word of God. We talked about inspiration, preservation, those things. Then we spent a night talking about what is the Bible, and we kind of just broke the Bible down for you and showed you how it's divided, how it's organized, and where it came from. We spent a sermon on is the Bible reliable, and we talked about the reliability of the Bible as a historic book and as an ancient document and uh, all of those things. And then um, last week, I, I laid a foundation for the doctrine of the King James Bible. And mainly what we want you to take away from that is that th there is a need for an every word Bible. There is a need to have a Bible that is perfect, that is preserved, that is infallible. Now here at Verity Baptist Church, we believe that the King James Bible is the inspired, preserved, infallible, and inerrant word of God. And we're going to spend uh, the night tonight just comparing the King James Bible to other versions. Now before we get into that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some an introduction and I, I want to give you some uh, information about the King James Bible. Uh, but I hope you'll get excited about, about this. And I know some of you have already heard me preach this before, and we've done it. When I was growing up, we went to a church uh, where every November, in November they called it Bible Month, and uh, every Sunday night in the month of November, the pastor would go through and kind of do what we're doing tonight. I was always super excited about it, every November. Even though I'd heard it many, <laughs> several times, I was always excited. So it's good for you to hear it again, to learn it, to be refreshed. Uh, take down some notes. I'd encourage you to take some notes down, and this will help you, yeah, you know, when you're talking to family members and co-workers and things like that. But uh, let's begin there in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. This is a very well-known verse. You know it. Uh, regarding the Word of God, the Bible says, For the Word of God is quick, and that word quick means alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. The Bible uh, tells us that the Bible is powerful. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Keep your finger there in Hebrews. We're going to uh, come back uh, towards the book of Hebrews, towards the end of the sermon. But go with me to the book of Jeremiah, if you would, Jeremiah 23, uh, towards the end of the Old Testament. You've got the major prophets there, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Uh, go to Jeremiah 23, and look at verse number 29. And I want to lay this foundation, because tonight what we're going to do is we're just going to, we're going to take modern Bible versions, and we're just going to set them side by side with the King James Bible and just compare back and forth uh, between the two. And, you know, we're, we're really not going to do much in defending the Word of God tonight uh, because the Word of God doesn't need you and I to defend it. The Word of God will defend itself. And it is quick and it is powerful. Jeremiah 23 and verse 29, the Bible says this, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord? And like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. See, someone said this, the word of God is like a lion. You don't need to defend the lion. You just let it loose to defend itself. And that's really what we're going to do tonight. We're going to just let the lion of the word of God loose uh, and, and let it defend itself as we compare it to uh, these other modern Bible versions or modern perversions of uh, the Bible. And I'd like you to go with me to the book of Psalms, if you would. Right in the center of your Bible, you're more than father more than likely fall in the book of Psalms. And I'll explain to you how we're going to compare the King James Bible. The first thing we're going to do tonight is we're going to uh, compare it by examining the source text. And I'll, I'll go through that as quickly as I can. I do, I, I do want to give you some thoughts in regards to the source text, and, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. And then we're going to spend most of our time tonight examining the different passages in the text itself. And uh, so we're going to look at the source text, we're going to look at uh, the, the text itself, and when we're talking about the source text, what we're talking about is the fact that your Bible and the Bible that you and I hold obviously was not written in English, all right? What you hold in your hand and what I hold in my hand is a translation of the Word of God. And for example, specifically speaking, uh, in regards to the New Testament, 
the New Testament was primarily written in Greek. And when we're talking about the King James Bible and any other Bible version, the NIV, the ASV, the ESV, whatever, they all are translated from a Greek uh, text. Are you there in Psalm 68? Look at verse number 11. I want you to notice what the Bible says about the Word of God. Psalm 68 and verse number 11. Psalm 68 and verse 11. The Bible says this, The Lord gave the Word. That's inspiration, by the way. That's where the Word of God came from, from the Lord. The Lord gave the Word. And then notice what the Bible says. Great, great was the company of those that published it. The Bible tells us that when God gives His Word... People are interested in his word, and great, meaning huge, is the number of people that publish his word. And that's not only true of the uh, Old Testament, it's also true of the New Testament. Now, here's what I want you to understand, and, and, I, and, I, want, and I, I won't spend a lot of time on this tonight. We're going to spend most of our time just comparing the different Bible versions. But here's what you need to get. The, whatever Bible version you're talking about, whether you're holding a King James Bible in your hand or you've got a New International Version or an English Standard Version or the New King James Version or the New American Standard Version, those are translations from a Greek text. And here's what most people don't understand, and I think I really want to make sure that you guys get this. When we're talking about modern Bible versions, we're talking about different underlying Greek text. Your King James Bible was translated from a different underlying Greek text than the NIV was tra translated from, than the New American Standard was translated from, than the English Standard Version was translated from. There, it's not like, because people get this idea like, oh, it's the, the New Testament was written in Greek, and then the translators changed, changed it so that they're all different. No, we're actually talking about two different Greek texts. There is a Greek text that our King James Bible was translated from, and then there is a Greek text that every modern Bible version is translated from. And I want to just give you some quick facts about those texts. Now, the King James Bible was translated from the Greek text that is called the Textus Receptus. The Textus Receptus, and again, the New Testament was primarily written in Greek. The originals, we've talked about this as we've been studying these doctrines on Sunday nights. The originals are gone. They don't exist. Nobody has them. Nobody has the original parchment that Paul wrote, that Peter penned down, that Luke wrote. Those are gone. All we have is translations and we have copies of the original. And we've talked about this in other sermons where we've, we've got manuscripts that go back to 30 to 50 years from the original as opposed to other ancient documents that are 1,000 years after the original. And I'm not going to re-preach that. When we talk about those manuscripts, here's what I want you to understand. There are, and, and the number changes a little bit from time to time, but there are 5,300, 5,309 uh, is the number that, that I got, existing Greek manuscripts of the New Testament available today. So in the entire world, if you were to round up, and they've done this, all of the Greek manuscripts that are, are, uh, that are out there in existence today, the number you would get would be 5,309. These are fragments of different passages in the New Testament. Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. But we've got 5,309 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament available today. Of those 5,309, 95 to 97% of them agree with each other. And what that means is this that if you've got multiple uh, books of John, multiple books of Matthew, multiple books of the same passage or the same chapter of Corinthians or Galatians, when you compare them, they say the same thing. They say exactly the same thing. 95 to 97 percent of the 5,309 existing Greek manuscripts all agree together. So that 95 to 97 percent that all agree with each other, those are called the majority texts. And they're called the majority texts because of the fact that they're the majority of the available texts out there and they all agree together. That majority text is what became the Textus Receptus, which is where your King James Bible was translated from. Now, let me just give you some real quick history. A man named Erasmus 
who was a brilliant scholar, uh, basically examined a collection of the majority texts, Greek manuscripts, and he compiled them, meaning he put them in order, he put the, the and there wasn't verses at the time that he did this, but he, he put it, what we would call verses and chapters, into the order that they go together, and he basically compiled the Greek New Testament. So he took the 95 to 97% Greek manuscripts that were available, put them all in order, made sure they all agreed and, and found the ones that agreed, and then he compiled them into what's known as the Texas Receptus today, the first Greek New Testament in the way you and I know it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, through the book of Revelation, all compiled together. And that Texas Receptus is the underlying Greek text that our King James Bible is translated from. All right, so I want you to know these terms. It's called the majority text because it was taken from the majority of manuscripts, 95 to 97% of the manuscripts agree together. It's called the Texas Receptus, or the received text. That's what the word Receptus means in text, uh, Texas Receptus, the received text, because it is the text that for generations has been agreed upon by all of Christianity that this is the Word of God. Erasmus compiled it together, and that was just, look, for hundreds of years, that was the Bible, that's what was considered the Bible, and here's what you need to understand. Not only was our King James Bible based on the Greek uh, Texas Receptus, but every ancient Bible version basically all came from the same Texas uh, Receptus. And I'll give you some, some, if you want to write these down, you don't need to write these down, but I'll, I'll just give you some examples. There are other ancient Bibles that were translated that are even older than the King James Bible, and they all agree with the Texas Receptus, or they were translated from the Texas Receptus. They use that as their Greek underline. Even, even if it wasn't called the Texas Receptus, that majority text is what they use. Here's some examples. The Peshitta version, which was translated in A.D. 150. The Italic Bible, that was translated in A.D. 157. The Waldensian Bible, translated in A.D. 120 and onward. The Gaelic Bible, translated in A.D. 177, that's uh, from southern France. The Gothic Bible, translated in A.D. 330 to 350. The Old Syriac Bible, translated in A.D. 400. The Armenian Bible, translated in A.D. 400. Uh, there are still 1,244 copies of this version in existence today. The, Armenia, uh, uh, the Palestinian Syriac Bible, translated in A.D. 450. The French Bible of Oliveton, translated in 1535. The Czech Bible, translated in 1602. And the Italian Bible of uh, Diodati, translated in 1602, were all translated using this Greek Texas Receptus. And here's why I'm bringing that up. Because if you were to take our King James Bible and translate it to the majority of the Greek text, it would agree. If you would take our King James Bible and compare it to the majority of, of ancient Bibles out there. I mean, we're talking about books that were A.D. 150, A.D. 330, A.D. 400. These are ancient books, and they would agree with the King James Bible. Obviously, they're in different languages, but if you were to look at what they're saying, they're saying the same thing. Not only that. But before our King James Bible, there were other English Bible versions that were translated from the Texas Receptus. In fact, from Tyndale's New Testament, and Tyndale uh, was, of course, the person who first translated the Greek New Testament. He took Erasmus's text, Texas Receptus, and he translated it into English. From Tyndale's New Testament to the late 1800s, early 1900s, prior to the 20th century, there were seven major English Bible translations, and they were all from, taken from the Texas Receptus. They all agreed with each other. The first one was, of course, Tyndale's first New Testament, uh, translated in 1526. You had Miles Coverdale's Bible in 1535, the Matthew's Bible in 1500 to 1555, the Great Bible in 1539, the Geneva Version in 1560, the Bishop's Bible in 1568, and the King James Version in 16 number 11. The interesting thing is this. Really, all of those seven Bible versions were really just a, uh, a, a, a revision of the prior. Tyndale wrote the first uh, uh, English New Testament from the Texas Receptus, and then the Miles Coverdale Bible was just finishing up his work. Then the Matthews Bible was really just a revision of 
the, uh, uh, of the Miles Coverdale, and the Great Bible was a revision of the Matthews Bible, and the Geneva Version just added chapter references and, and verse references to the Great Bible, and the Bishop's Bible was just a revision, and the King James Version was really, honestly, just a revision of the Bishop's Bible, and here's what I want you to say. Those other Bibles had mistakes in them. They weren't perfect, but they were taken from a proper text. They, they weren't complete, but they weren't corrupt. They weren't complete, but they agreed with each other. Here's what's super interesting. You had seven English Bibles that brought us to the King James Bible that we can say it's perfect, it's inspired, it's preserved, it's inerrant, it's infallible, it's without um, any problems. Are you still in the book of Psalms? Look at Psalm 12 and verse number 6. Psalm 12 and verse 6 is a famous passage in regards to the Word of God. What's interesting is you have Erasmus's Greek text compiling the Textus Receptus. He takes the majority text and he compiles it into a Textus Receptus. Then you have seven English translations that bring us, revisions really, that bring us to the King James Bible that's perfect. Psalm 12 and verse 6, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, uh, the psalmist said, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, and then he said this, purified seven times. Isn't that interesting? That our King James Bible, from, from the Texas Receptus to the King James, you had seven revisions that brought us to the King James Bible. And then the Bible in the book of Psalms says, hey, the words uh, of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So when it comes to our King James Bible, you need to understand, there's 5,309 manuscripts. 95 to 97% of them agree with each other. They're the majority text. A man named Erasmus took the majority text and compiled it into one Greek New Testament, which became the Greek New Testament that everyone believed. So it became known as the Textus Receptus or the received text, the text that we have received from prior Christians, prior generations. Every ancient translation used the Textus Receptus as its base, and every English translation from Erasmus to the King James Bible used the Textus Receptus as its base. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. 2 Corinthians, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. You say, okay, well, what about the other modern Bible versions? Because you said that those are translated from a different underlying text, a different source text. Those modern Bible versions are translated from the Greek text, and they've changed the name, I think, uh, but it was basically the Greek text that was compiled by two men named Westcott and Horton. Now, I don't have the time to go into the history of these guys. They were uh, wicked men. They were false prophets. They were not of God. What these men did... Is that because remember I told you we have 5,309 manuscripts, 95 to 97 percent of them agree together. It's called the majority text. Well, what Westcott and Hort did is they took the three to five percent of manuscripts that contradicted the majority text and they used that to create their own Westcott and Hort Greek text. It's called the West Hart and Gore Creek uh, text, um, and it's based off the uh, 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 it's it's referred to as the minority text. Because obviously, it's using 3 to 5% of the 5,309 manuscripts available out there. And it's based primarily on two texts, one called the Sinaiticus and the other one called the Vaticanus. Now look, just, just right off the bat as a Baptist, when you're taking a, a Bible translation that's translated from a Greek, from an ancient Greek text called the Vaticanus, you know why it was called the Vaticanus? Because it, it was found in, in, a, in a trash can in the basement of the Vatican. Okay, the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Babylon Mother Harlot Church is where this text came from. But these men took the 3 to 5% of manuscripts that disagree with the majority text. They compiled it. They called it the minority text. They made a Greek New Testament. And then they used that Greek New Testament in order to... Uh, translate these new modern Bible versions. So here's what you need to understand. When you're looking at the NIV versus the King James, you're not looking at two translations from the same Greek text. You're looking at two translations from two different Greek 
text. Now, just a couple of facts about the Westcott and Hort. The Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus, when you take these two Greek documents, these two on their own contradict each other over 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you can find 3,000 times when they have information that are contradicting each other in the Gospels. The Codex Sinaiticus, also called the Aleph or the A, was put in a trash heap by the monks of St. Catherine's Monastery, and uh, nearly every page of the manuscript, there are corrections and revisions done by 10 different people where they're like scratching things out of the text itself. Um, on uh, uh, the Codex Vaticanus, all, usually referred to as B, uh, is kept by the Roman Catholic Church, of course, from the Vatican. In the Gospels alone, it receives, it leaves out 237 words, 452 clauses, and 748 whole sentences. Now, here's what you need to understand. You say, well, why in the world? If there's 5,309 majority texts out there, you've got these texts that were compiled into the Textus Receptus. They were used by every English translation from Erasmus to the late 1800s. They were used by every other language out there, ancient Bible. Why would someone then take 3 to 5% of the minority text that contradicts itself 3,000 times in the Gospels and use that to translate out of. Well, their big reasoning is they'll say this. They'll say the 3,500 manuscripts that we have today, yeah, they have problems. Yeah, they contradict each other. Yeah, they're the minority text, but they're older than the majority text. And they'll say these manuscripts are older. So in the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s, they began to push this agenda and say, well, these are older so therefore, they are more reliable. They are more accurate, so we should start using that. Now, here's the problem with that. And I talked about this last week, but I want to show it to you again. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17, we have the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth. The Apostle Paul is writing to a church in the first century, before he, the New Testament has even been compiled or finished. And he says this to the church at Corinth. He says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Now here's what I want you to understand. Paul, while penning the book of 2 Corinthians in the first century, before the New Testament was even finished, tells us that there were already people during his lifetime that were corrupting the word of God. In fact, he said there was many. He said, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. So look, the fact that you can find old manuscripts that are corrupt shouldn't surprise any of us. Paul told us about it. And we should learn that older, older doesn't mean reliable. I mean, think about this just in a, in a very practical sense. In my office, I, if you go into my office, I, you'll find within my, within my office, you'll find many Bibles, several King James Bibles that I have in there. But you know what you'll also find in my Bibles? You'll find a bunch of modern Bible versions, right? Uh, and here in a few minutes, I'm going to have four guys come up, and they're going to be reading out of my modern Bible versions that I own. I've got an NIV. I've got a New King James. I've got an ESV. I've got a New American Standard. Some of you have given me those Bibles. I've had some of you give me a Book of Mormon that you ran into, and you're like, here, Pastor, you know, maybe you can use this to preach out of one day. I've had people give me uh, the, the Jehovah's Witness uh, Bible. You say, well, why do you have those Bibles uh, in, your, in your office? Well, I have them so that I can preach sermons like this, so that I can show people the differences, right? They're not there because I'm studying out of them, but I have them there for reference to show people. Here's what's interesting. If you were to look at this King James Bible that I have in my hand right now, the one that I read, the one that I use, if you were to look at it and compare it to the modern versions that are in my office, you know which one's going to look a little more used? You know which one's going to look a little more deteriorated? It's going to be this one. I mean, just look, look, at, look, at, my, 
You know, I, I recently uh, preached through the book of Ezekiel. If you just look at my Bible from the book of Ezekiel, you know what you see? You see a bunch of arrows and notes and underlinings and cross-references, just page after page after page of my notes and my thoughts and my ideas in regards to this. You open that NIV, it's going to look brand new. You know why? Because I'm not reading out of the NIV. It's in, my, it's in there for reference. But I'm not studying out of that. I'm not underlining anything in that. I'm not memorizing anything out of that. And here's all I'm telling you. Here's all I'm telling you. This one is probably going to fall apart first before any of those four. And I'll buy another one. And I'll write notes in that one. And I'll underline things in that one. And I'll write arrows and, and cross references. And that one will fall apart before any of those. And if coronavirus kills all of us, and 100 or 200 years from now, people dig into my office, and they look through there, and they're like, man, the majority of Bibles that this guy had were King James. They're all deteriorated. They're underlined. They're all messed up. But look at these. The minority that he has are these four Bibles, but they're older and pristine. You know, does that make any sense that those are better? Actually, you know what? The fact that you don't have the fact that the actual manuscripts that Christians believe, put their faith in, they were using those, they were preaching out of it, they had them with them when they were soul winning, that's more evidence that they received those. You say, well, yeah, but the Vaticanus was in a trash can in a basement of the Vatican for a thousand years. Yeah, for a reason. For a reason it wasn't used. For a reason. So the fact that it's old doesn't make it better because Paul even told us during his lifetime there were those who were corrupting the Word of God. So how do we tell the difference between the King James and all the other Bibles? Well, we begin with the source text. We realize that there are two different texts, 5,309 manuscripts, 95 to 97 of them are, uh, agree with each other, are the majority text, were compiled into the Textus Receptus that every ancient Bible was translated from and that every English Bible was translated from through the King James Bible through the 1800s, and then you've got the minority text, 3 to 5% of the trash that contradicts itself, contradicts the majority text, was compiled by two wicked men named Westcott and Hort into a New Testament. And then every modern Bible version today is translated from that text. You say, why? Because it's older. That means nothing. It means nothing that it's older. Just because it's old, it could still be corrupt. Look, Satan was corrupting the Word of God from the Garden of Eden doesn't make it right. So we can tell the difference by just thinking logically through the text, the source text. You should already kind of have an idea which one's the right Bible. But the other thing that we can do is we can just examine the different texts themselves. And that's what we're going to do for the rest of the night. We're going to spend time examining the texts themselves. I'm going to uh, ask these guys to come up here that I asked them to help me. So guys, come on up and uh, make your way up here. And here's what we're basically going to do tonight. We're just going to compare, come on up and just right there on the first step. Good, good job, guys. Thank you. We're going to compare the King James to these modern Bible translations. And, and here's, here's the truth. And I've used this illustration before. If you, want to, if you have a diamond and a cubic zirconium, if you're looking at that cubic zirconium all by itself, you're probably not going to be able to, unless you have a trained eye, you know what to look for, you're probably not going to be able to tell that it's a fake. But you put that thing right next to a real diamond, and it becomes real evident which one's real and which one's not, right? That's why some of you guys avoid jewelry stores with your wife's uh, wedding uh, ring, right? Because it's like, I don't want her seeing what a real diamond looks like, all right? Well, I used to work at a, when I was a kid, I used to work at a check cashing store for a while, and then I started work, worked at a bank for a while, and we, we dealt with a lot of money. And you know what they would tell us? They would tell us, in order to be able to tell what counterfeit money is, you know, people get this idea like, oh, you got to study counterfeit money in order to make sure you don't receive counterfeit money. But the problem with uh, studying counterfeit money is that counterfeit money is always changing. So it's hard to, like, study what counterfeit money is like because it's changing all the time. So you know what they would have you do? They would have you just count, feel, and touch real money. Count lots of real money. Because if you got used to the feel, the look of real money, and then you put a counterfeit dollar in your fingers, you could tell. This isn't like the others. The way you tell whether something's real versus something fake is you just compare it to the real thing. So here's what we're going to do tonight. We're just going to compare the Word of God with these modern Bible versions. And I think it should be clear which one is uh, the Word of God as we compare the diamond 
with the fake. So I'm going to have these guys go ahead and uh, introduce themselves and tell them um, and, and tell you what Bible version, Bible per version they are reading from. All right. So go ahead, brother. Uh, go, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Aiden. Uh, I'm going to be reading from the NIV. Eli, this is the ESV. Luke, I read now the New American Standard Bible. My name is RJ. I'll be reading from the New King James. All right. So thank you guys for your help. We've got our four false prophets here uh, tonight. So no, they're, I appreciate their help. They're going to help. Uh, uh, so, so I'd like you to turn to these passages. We're going to look at several passages and just compare them tonight. We're going to start in Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 14. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14. I'm not going to have them read all of them. I'm just going to give you some examples tonight. I encourage you to write these down and take notes. Matthew chapter 7. Now, if you have a King James Bible in your hand, I'm going to read to you out of the King James, and then we'll have these guys read out of these other modern Bible versions, and we'll tell the difference. Maybe you're here tonight, and you've got an NIV in your hand. You've got a new King James in your hand. You have an American Standard. That's all right. We're not mad at you, but you ought to go by, you know, follow along and look at it. And look, honestly, look at what the Bible says and what your Bible is saying. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. There's a very famous verse in the Bible. This is what the King James uh, says, Matthew 7, 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now this is Jesus speaking about people who go to heaven Earlier, he talked about broad is the way and wide is the gate that needed to lead it to destruction. But here he's talking about people that are going to go to heaven. And he says, look, straight. The word straight is an older word that means narrow, a narrow passage. He says straight is the gate. And then he says narrow is the way. See, these are synonyms. He's just describing that the way to heaven is a straight, is a narrow you know, sometimes people think the word straight, they're talking about it's not crooked, but it's, it's straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, meaning it's narrow. He says, look, the way to hell is broad. Many people are going there. He says, the way to heaven, it's narrow. He says, and few there be that find it. And look, you go soul winning with us, you start knocking doors and asking people the question, do you know for sure if you die today, you go to heaven? You know it's true. Most people in this world are going to hell. It's few that are taking the narrow road of going to heaven. All right, so let's go ahead and begin with the English Standard Version. Which one of you guys has that? I think it's Brother Luke. English Standard Version, go ahead and read. Oh, I'm sorry, Brother Eli. Uh, Matthew 7, 14. Matthew 7, 7, 14 says, For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Okay, so go ahead and read that one more time, Brother. Read, read what it says. For the gate is narrow, okay, and so stop the... right there. So here's what the King James says. Because straight is the gate, all right, he said, his says, for the gate is narrow. Those two things, they agree. What's, it say? What's the next thing it says? And the way is hard. And the way is hard. Here's what the King James says, and narrow is the way. Now, let me ask you this. Are, are those two verses saying the same thing? I mean, the King James says, hey, it's straight, meaning it's narrow. And then because it's written in an eloquent way, it says, straight is the gate, narrow is the way. He say, both times he's saying, it's straight, it's narrow. The English Standard Version says, hey, narrow is the way and hard. Now, look, here's what you need to understand. And this is what I was taught when we were growing up. We were being taught these things. Things that are different are not the same. These two Bible versions in Matthew 7, 14 are not saying the same thing. One is Jesus saying, hey, few people are going to heaven because most people are going to hell in the King James. In the ESV, Jesus is saying, hey, the way to heaven is hard. Okay, how about the New King James? Let's, let's look at the New King James. Now, a lot of times the New King James, people will get confused. Because they're like, oh, it's like the King James, but it's just updated. Now, look, that's not true. They've messed with the New King James as well. Go ahead, uh, Brother RJ, and read the New King James. Matthew 7, 14 on the New King James the Bible reads, Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, hold on a second. The ESV says hard is the way. The New King James says difficult is the way. The King James just says narrow is the way. Now, let me ask you something. Is, is, is going to heaven difficult or hard? I mean, how does somebody get saved? Believe, right? The Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, listen, guy, it's going to be pretty hard. It, it's going to be difficult. It's going to take. No, he said, look, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know that getting saved is easy? 
And people say, oh, you guys with your easy believism, you're, you're making uh, uh, the gospel cheap. No, actually, you're making the gospel cheap because you know what? It's easy for me to get saved because the precious blood of my Savior did the hard part. Your gospel is cheap when you're telling people, you say, why are these modern Bible versions saying that it's difficult? You know why they're saying it's difficult? Because then a false prophet can stand up and say, you got to repent of your sins. You got to go to the confessional booth. You got to give money. You got to quit drinking. You got, look, if, if the gospel was you got to quit sinning to be saved, that would be difficult. That would be hard. But you know what, the, you know what Jesus said? Jesus said this, Matthew 18, 33, and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says that in order to get saved, you have to humble yourself like a little child. Look, salvation is not hard. It's easy enough that a child can do it. Because all you have to do is believe. That's what the King James Bible says. But what do the modern Bible versions say? They say, no, it's hard. It's difficult. Now look, right there, we've got, two, they're saying two different things. You say, why are they saying two different things? Because they have two different underlying Greek texts. And you just got to look at it and say, well, which one's right? The one that says it's narrow or the one that says it's difficult? Well, is salvation difficult? Uh, let's, let's look at Luke chapter 2 and verse 33. Luke chapter 2 and verse 33. Now, in Luke chapter 2, we have this narrative. What that means is that it's a story. And in the Bible, you will have these books that are telling you a story, and you'll have a narrator that is kind of telling you the story. Now, in the book of Luke, the narrator is Luke. But really, it's the Holy Spirit, because holy men God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And I want you to notice in Luke 2.33, the Bible says, and Joseph. So the narrator, which is the Holy Spirit, he's telling us the story and this is when Joseph and Mary lost Jesus. Remember that story? For three days. That story's there to make you feel better about your child rearing. And, you know, they lost Jesus and they have to go back and find him. And the Bible says this, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. That's what the uh, King James Version says. Let's see what the New International Version says. Pass the mic over there. Thank you, guys. The New International Version uh, says in Luke... 233, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Now, hold on a second. The King James says Joseph and his mother marveled at those things. The New International Version says the child's father and mother. Now, let me ask you a question. Was Joseph the father of Jesus? No. I mean, who, who was the father of Jesus? God the Father, right? He's the Son of God. You say, oh, well, what's the big deal? It just calls him the child's father. Well, the big deal is that you just attack the deity of Christ. Because if Joseph was the father of Jesus and Mary was the mother of Jesus, you know what that would make Jesus? A human, a sinful human with Adam's sinful blood in him like you and like me. The King James Bible is sure to say, hey, Joseph and his mother, because Joseph was his stepfather, was acting as his father here on earth and providing for him and all those things. But Joseph was not his father. Jesus did not get his blood from Joseph. Jesus was not begotten of Joseph. Jesus was begotten of God the Father. The King James is sure to make that distinction. The NIV, the child's father and mother. How about the English Standard Version? What does that say? Luke 2, 33. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. So, sounds just like the NIV, right? The NIV says child's father and mother. ESV says his father and his mother. What about the New American Standard Bible? It says in chapter 2, 33, it says, and his father and mother. So, look, amazed. we looked at these, and by the way, the reason we chose these modern Bible versions is because these are the most popular modern Bible versions today. The New International Version, the uh, English Standard Version, the New King James, the New American Standard most churches you walk into, these are the versions they're going to be using. There's lots of other versions out there that are more corrupt than these ones. These are the most popular. And look, the, we've already, we looked at two passages. One saying salvation is difficult and Jesus had a father named Joseph. And then the King James is saying, no, salvation is just narrow. And Joseph was not his father. God is his father. It's an attack on the deity of Christ. It's an attack on the doctrine of the deity of Christ. Let's look at John 3.36. 
Because you may be thinking like, oh, well, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Look, every word of God is pure is what the Bible says. Amen. Jesus said, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. We need an every word Bible. Look, either he said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way, or he said uh, uh, that difficult is the way and hard is the way, but he didn't say both. Do you understand that? Somebody's lying here. Either the King James is true and these modern Bible versions are lying or these modern Bible versions are telling a lie and the King James is true. Let's look at John 3.36. Here's what the King James says. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, doesn't that make sense? I mean, he says, if you believe, you have everlasting life. And if you, the, if you do the opposite of believing, if you, he says, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. That makes logical sense. He's saying, if you believe, you'll be saved. If you don't believe, you're not going to uh, see life, but the wrath of God abideth on you. What is the English Standard Version? Let's look at that one. John 3, 36. Whosoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Now, right up to there, we're, we're, we're pretty good, right? I mean, that's pretty similar to what we just read. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Okay. King James goes on to say, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. What does the English Standard say? Whosoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but no. the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, are those two things the same thing? One says, if you believe, you're saved. If you don't believe, you're not saved. The other one says, if you believe, you're saved. And if you don't obey, you're going to go to hell. Now, look, why, why would it say that? Well, again, if, if a preacher wants to get up and say, hey, you better obey. You better do what the Bible says. You better keep the commandments. Do you see how it's messing with the doctrine of salvation. It's teaching a work salvation to say that you have to obey in order to be saved. What about the New American Standard? Let's see what that one says. New American Standard says in verse 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Look, I, I think it should be becoming pretty clear, right? We've, we've got, we, it's, not, it's not a different translation of the same Bible. These are two different Bibles. In one of them, Jesus is God. In the other one, Jesus is a, hu a sinful human like you and I with a dad named Joseph and a mom named Mary. In one of them, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And in another one, but it's not difficult. In another one, no, it's difficult. It's hard. Well, why is it difficult? Well, because you've got to obey, apparently. The King James says, hey, believe and you'll be saved. Well, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. These modern Bible perversions say, Hey, whosoever does not obey the Son, whosoever does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Look, these Bible verses are not saying the same thing. Amen. You might walk out of here and say, that guy's crazy, he's a cult leader, I can't believe he'd attack other Bibles. You can walk out of here and say whatever you want, but you can't walk out of here saying that those Bibles are saying the same thing because they're not. Amen. Things that are different are not the same. So which one's lying? The one that affirms the deity of Christ or the one that makes Jesus a human? The one that keeps salvation as believing and not believing or the one that makes it difficult? That makes it based on your obedience? That makes it hard? How about Acts 8, 36 through 38? Acts 8, 36 through 38. Now in Acts 8, 36, 37, 38, we have a story of Philip. Remember the evangelist? We talked about him on Wednesday night. He's preaching the gospel, and I'll read to you from the King James. Verse 36 says this, And as they went on their way, they came up unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So the eunuch asked this question. He says, Hey, there's some water here. And he asked a very specific question. Here's the question. What is hindering me from getting baptized? What is stopping me from getting baptized? Verse 37, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Because he asked a question. He said, what's stopping me from getting baptized? And he said, hey, if you believe with all your heart, you can get baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized. Now, does that make perfect sense? Verse 36, he asked the question, what's stopping me from getting baptized? What does hinder me uh, to be baptized? Verse 37, he says, if you believe, then you may. He says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And in verse 38, he's getting baptized. I mean, that sounds like, that, that's great. Makes perfect sense. What about the New International Version? What does that say? 
Um, the NIV says in Acts 8, thir verse 36, As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Verse 38, And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. Now, Brother Aiden, i got to ask you a question, all right? You read verse 36, and you read verse 38. Um, but I think you skipped verse 37. Can you read verse 37? Oh, yeah. Let me, let me look for it. Let me find it. Uh, there, there is no verse 37, Pastor. Okay, so let me ask you something, Aiden. Does it say 36, 37, and it just keeps going? Or does it, are you telling me that it actually says verse 36, and then verse 37, blank, and then verse 38, and it keeps going. Is that what you're telling me? Correct. Yeah, there's no verse, there's no number 37 at all. It's just gone. It's gone. But do they change the number? They, they just go from 36 to, 30, to 38? Uh, correct, yes. Now, look, isn't that interesting to you? <clears throat> I mean, not only is it not scriptural, it can't even count. <laughs> I mean, it goes from verse 36 to verse 38, just removes verse 37. They don't even change the numbers to, like, co cover it up. They're so lazy, they just remove the verse. And hope you won't notice. And, you know, they put it in a way, they do it in paragraph form so that the verses start uh, in the middle so they hope you don't notice. They literally, they hope you don't notice. They just remove, they remove the entire verse. It just goes verse 36, verse 38. Uh, maybe he has a misprint. Okay, well, how about the English Standard Version? What does that one say? Acts 8, 36. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? 38. And he commanded the chariots to stop. And they both came down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Brother Eli, why didn't you read verse 37? It's not there. It's just gone. It's gone. Now look. Look. In the King James, you have verse 36. What does Henry baptize? Verse 37, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Verse 38, they go down into the water and he baptizes them. But the NIV, he says in verse 36, what do I have to do to get baptized? And apparently nothing, because in verse 38, he's getting baptized. The ESV, he says, what's preventing me from getting baptized? And apparently nothing, they just remove verse 37, and in verse 38, they're getting baptized. Now notice, they move, remove verse 37 that says, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Why would they remove that verse? Makes you kind of think that maybe Satan's behind this thing. Now you say, well, why would somebody want that Bible? Well, look, I, I, Catholics would love this Bible, Right? Because if you don't have to believe to be baptized, hey, I can use the NIV to justify infant baptism. I can use the NIV to justify all sorts of things because apparently when somebody asks a question, what do I have to do to be baptized? There's no requirement. You, we just baptize you. No, there is a requirement. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Amen. And they just remove the verse. They don't even change the numbers. They just go 35, 36, 38. And by the way, there are 16 entire verses missing out of modern Bible versions, just like that example. Six, if you do nine chapters a day in the month of January with an NIV, and I'm not encouraging you to do that, if you were to do that, you would come across 16 different times when the verses just go 35, 36, 38, they just remove an entire verse, just because they felt like it, just because they didn't like it. Look, these Bibles are not the, it's not that, oh, well, no, it's just the these and the thous, the King James a little written older, and they just modernize it. No, they corrupted it. They changed it to mess with the doctrine. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look, we could do this all night. I'm not going to do it all night. I'm going to do it enough, though, to make sure that you don't walk out of here thinking like, oh, he just found a few examples. Look, these are extreme examples. I'm going to beat the horse long enough, you know, to, after it's dead, just to, you know, turn him into glue a little bit. 1 Corinthians 1, look at verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, here's what the King James Version says. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Isn't that true? I mean, the unsaved world out there, they, they hear the preaching of the cross and they think, like, that's foolish. But then he says this, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now look, unto us that are saved, the preaching of the cross makes perfect sense because we have the Holy Spirit, because we believe it, because we love it. Okay, what does the New International Version say in 1 Corinthians 1.18? 1 
the NIV says in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, hold on a second. King James, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. New International Version, read that last part again, but to us who are what? But to us who are being saved. Now, it, hold on a second. Go ahead. To us that are being it, saved. To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, let me ask you, are those two statements saying the same thing? Hmm. Unto us which are saved and to us which are being saved are not saying the same thing. Unto us which are saved, S-A-V-E-D, is it's done. I am saved. I'm done saved. I got saved. I confessed. I called. He saved me. It's not open for debate. It's finished. First, New International Version, unto us who are being saved. It, it just turns salvation into a process. I'm in the process of being saved. Look, you're not in the process of being saved. You're either, you're either saved or you're not. You either believe or you don't. Jesus said, he called it being born again. You, you were born in a moment. You, when you were born, look, they didn't write down when, they, when you got born. They didn't write down, well, uh, you know, from uh, October 20th through October 23rd. Now, your, labor, your mom's labor might have been that long. But you got, you, you got born in a moment. You came out and you were born. There's a, it, there, there was a moment in time when you were born. With salvation, there was a moment in time when you believed and you got saved. No one's being saved. But, but according to the NIV, well, of course you're being saved if it's difficult. If, it's, if it depends on me obeying the Son. Do you understand how it's changed the doctrine of salvation? It's attacked the deity of Christ. It's attacked the doctrine of salvation. Okay, how about the other uh, modern Bible versions? The English Standard Version, what does that say? 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. So it says the same thing. What about the New American Standard Bible? It says in verse 18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It says the same thing. What about the New King James? The New King James is going to do it for us, right? I mean, it's just like the King James is just newer, right? What does that say? First Corinthians 1.18, the New King James reads, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved... Ah. It is the power of God. What a surprise. It let us down. Look, all these modern versions, they say you're being saved. King James, you are saved. Unto us which are saved. And you say, well, what's the big deal? It's just a little word they added. Yeah, but it changes the entire meaning. We're not being saved. We are saved. Salvation is not a process. Salvation is not difficult. Salvation is not hard. Salvation is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. so simple a child could do it. Go to 2 Samuel 21. 2 Samuel 21. And, and by the way, let me just say this. Because in case you, you've got this thought, you say, well, all the modern Bible versions are saying it, and the King James is the only one that's different. So it must be, it must be uh, you know, all, how can all these be wrong and this one right? Keep in mind, we're not talking about five different Bibles here. We're talking about two. Because all four of these were translated from the same Greek text of Westcott and Hoyt. This one was translated from the text of Scripture. And here's what I want you to understand. If you go back and find all the ancient Bibles from, the, from a thousand years ago, from different uh, languages, I read them all to you, you find all the ancient Bibles in different languages, and you find all the English Bibles before the King James, they'll all agree with the King James because they were all translated from the text of Scripture and disagree with this garbage. The reason there's so many of them is because they're all being translated from the same Greek text, a corrupted text, the minority text, the 3 to 5% of manuscripts that contradict themselves. And by the way, these Bibles contradict themselves. We've looked at some heavy doctrinal ones because I wanted to hit you. The deity of Christ, that's important. Salvation, that's important. Let's look at some things, just something a little more, more silly. All right, because, you know, these Bibles are silly. They can't count. I mean, they, we, we got to take these scholars back to uh, elementary school and teach them that it, it's, it's 35, 36, 37, son, 37, then 38, all right? So they're, they're kind of silly, but their silliness is even, is even more than that. In 2 Samuel 21, 19, 
we have a verse that says this. I'll read it for you. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhana, the son of Jerogim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. All right? So this is after David has already killed Goliath. Remember the famous story, David and Goliath? All right? Remember that story? Who's familiar with the story of David and Goliath? Raise your hand. Okay. Who knows that David killed Goliath? Raise your hand. Okay. I, I, are, you, are you guys all scholars, Bible college graduates? I mean, you just spend years in seminary. Okay, everybody knows David killed Goliath, right? That's one, like one of the most famous stories in the Bible. Here we're told that Elhana, the son of Jeregoam, and these names are difficult to say sometimes, so I feel bad for these guys. I'm asking to say it. A Bethlehemite slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite. So this is telling us that Goliath had five brothers. Remember David? He picked up five stones to kill Goliath just in case his brothers came after him. He, he had these brothers, and here we're told that Elhana slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite. All right? Let's see what the English Standard Version says in 2 Samuel 21, 19. 2 Samuel 21, 19. And there, were, and there was war against the Philistines in Gob, and Elhanan, the son of Jar Oregim, the Bethlehemite, struck down Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Now, hold on a second. 2 Samuel 21, 19, and the King James says, Elhana slew the brother of Goliath. That makes sense because if you go to 1 Samuel 17, David killed Goliath. In the ESV, in the English Standard Version, the most popular version today in the United States of America, you go to any of these community churches right now, and not right now because they don't have Sunday night services, but you go on a Sunday morning to the rock concert, they're going to be preaching out of the ESV. You take their ESV, you go to 1 Samuel 17 to the famous story of David and Goliath, and you know who it tells you killed Goliath? David. But then you go to 2 Samuel 21, 19, and it tells you that Elhana struck down Goliath. Okay, so who killed Goliath, David or Elhana? That is a contradiction in their Bible. Now, it's not a contradiction in the King James Bible, because in the King James it tells you Elhana slew the brother of Goliath. But these so-called scholars who can't count also don't know that David is the one who killed Goliath. They're telling you Elhana struck down Goliath. They say, oh, maybe that was just a mess up. Okay, how about the New American Standard? What does that say? American Standard Version says in verse 19, There was war with the Philistines again at Gob, and Elhanan, the son of J.R. Oregon, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Look, do you want to trust a Bible that doesn't even know who killed Goliath? Do you want to trust a Bible that can't even count 35, 36, 37, 38? Do you want to trust a Bible that tells you that salvation is difficult, that you have to believe and obey? that you're being saved? I mean, these are major issues in these modern Bible perversions. I think it should be pretty clear which one's the actual Word of God. It should be clear which one is the cubic zirconium and which one is the real thing. Let, let me show you one last thing, um, one last comparison, and, and we'll finish up. Go, go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Towards the end of the, New Test, of the Old Testament, excuse me. Maybe the New Testament in these guys' is Bible. But in, in Isaiah uh, 14, towards the end of the Old Testament, you got the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Isaiah 14, verse 12. In Isaiah 14 and verse 12, we have a very famous verse, a very interesting verse, for two reasons. It's the only verse in the entire Bible that gives us the name of Satan. Satan is a title, the devil is a title, all of those are titles. But he actually had a name when he was created, given to him by God. Isaiah 14 and verse 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? So we're told the name of Satan, Lucifer. And then we're also told his title that he had in heaven, Son of the Morning. In the King James Bible, he's called, O Lucifer, Son of the Morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nation. Now, let's look at this verse in the modern Bible versions. Let's start with the New International Version. 
The NIV reads in Isaiah 14, verse 12, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you, you who once laid low the nations. Now hold, I, I want you to notice a couple things. Number one, Lucifer is gone. Look, this ought to tell you who's behind these modern Bibles. Who would, who would benefit from removing his name from that verse? Wouldn't it be Satan himself? First of all, they just removed the name Lucifer. But then they also changed the title. Because in the King James, it's called Lucifer, son of the morning. In the New International Version, his name Lucifer is gone, and he's just called the morning star, O morning star. Now you say, well, what's the big deal? That kind of sounds the same, son of the morning or morning star. Here's, here's the big deal. The big deal is this. In fact, just go with me to the book of Revelation. Keep your finger right there in Isaiah. And go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22 and verse 16. In Revelation, it should be easy to find. It's the last book in the New Testament. Revelation 22 and verse 16. The Bible says this. I, Jesus. Revelation 22, 16. Is anybody wondering who's speaking here? Okay, this is Jesus speaking, right? The words are in red. If you got a red letter edition. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Notice what Jesus said of himself. He said, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and, don't miss this, morning star. You know that Jesus called himself the morning star? That's a title of Jesus. He says, I am, he, Jesus, he says, I am the root and the offspring of David. He said, and the bright and morning star. And in the King James, in Isaiah 14, 12, we're told, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Different title. Son of the morning is different than morning star. In the NIV, we remove the name Lucifer, and we give Lucifer the title of Jesus, morning star. I mean, do you understand what Satan is doing here? First, he removes his own name, and then he gives himself the title of Jesus. And by the way, in the NIV... In Revelation 22, 16, it calls Jesus the morning star. So here we have Lucifer refer, given the title of Jesus. He's called the morning star when the King James calls him the son of the morning. And the morning star is a title that is given to Jesus Christ. Look, this is just blaspheming the name of Christ. Giving the title of Jesus to Satan. Okay, what about the other uh, versions? Let's see what the English Standard Version says. Isaiah 14, 12 in the ESV says, how, are, how, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. All right, go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And you say, oh, well, that one's better. That one didn't say morning star. That one said, O day star. Well, at least it didn't give Jesus a title. Now, look, what I'm about to show you, there's no way this is a coincidence. In the King James Bible, Jesus is given the title, the morning star. In the King James Bible, in the book of Isaiah, we have Lucifer called the son of the morning. In the NIV, the name Lucifer is removed, and he's given the title, morning star, the title of Jesus. In the ESV, the name Lucifer is removed, and he's given this title, day star. Say, well, that's, that's better, right? I mean, he's not the morning star. Here's the problem. Day star is a title of Jesus also. 2 Peter 1.19. We have also, this should be a pretty familiar verse. We've been looking at it a lot the last several, several weeks. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star, referring to Jesus, arise in your hearts. The, Bible, the King James calls Jesus a day star. The ESV decides to give that title to Satan. The King James calls Jesus a morning star. The NIV decides to give that title to Satan. Is this a coincidence or is there an agenda? you got to be blind to not realize. You know what these modern Bible versions, they have Satan behind them. I mean, you got two different Bible, modern Bible versions. He removes his name, and in two different ones, he gives himself two different titles that belong to Jesus. The morning star and the day star. And by the way, the reason that Jesus is given those titles is because those are all a reference to the Son, 
and it's a reference to the resurrection of Christ. Just like the sun went down and it came up again, Jesus was buried and he rose up again. And then Lucifer gives himself that title. How about the New American Standard? What does that one say? Isaiah 14, 12 in the New American Standard says, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. So they changed morning star to star of the morning. Same thing. And here's all I'm telling you. This is blasphemy. And, and you can look at the NIV and say, well, maybe, you know, they kind of sounded similar. When you get to the ESV and they do the exact same thing, they're like, oh, man, let's change it from morning star to day star. They're just trying to, they're just trying to poke at Jesus. They're just trying to blaspheme Jesus any way they possibly can. And look, we just spend all night just looking at example after example, example after example. We're not going to do that. But I, 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 we've looked at several examples. I think it should be pretty clear that the King James Bible is the inspired, preserved, infallible, inerrant Word of God. And you say, well, what about the NIV? Well, what about the NIV? Attacking the deity of Christ, giving Lucifer the titles of Christ, making salvation difficult, making salvation obeying the Son. These are modern Bible. They're not versions. They're perversions of the Bible. Now, you're there in 2 Peter 1. I want you to stay there. We're going to look at a couple of things we're going to finish up. The, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Let's give you guys a round of applause for their help. I'll go ahead and take the mic. Yep, thank you. They did a great job. They were good false prophets. We appreciate that. So, 2 Peter 1, 19. We're going to finish right here, okay? This is the last sermon about the King James Bible. Next week, we're going to continue our doctrinal series, but we're going to get into something completely different from the Bible versions. But I just want to end with these verses. It's, it's funny to me how they took the day star out of the verse. They corrupt the word of God and they quote, they took a, a phrase out of a verse that's about the word of God. 2 Peter 1, 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. I hope you can leave here tonight looking at your King James Bible, just confidently knowing that we really do have a more sure word of prophecy. I mean, which one is sure? It's this one. There's no mistakes in it. There's no errors in it. There's no contradictions. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. And let me just go ahead and quickly explain that verse because sometimes you, you read those verses and people uh, don't understand it and, and, and um, you know, it's, it could be a confusing verse. So let me just explain it to you. What the Bible is talking about here, in, in Romans we're told that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What the Bible teaches is that the way that we are able to grow our faith is that when we spend time hearing the Word of God, then we can receive faith from the Word of God, which is why we teach our soul winners, make sure you're not just out there giving your little illustrations and giving your little examples. I'm all for illustrations. I'm all for examples. But you better be preaching the Word of God to them because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that's what this verse is saying. It's saying, look, we have also a more sure word of prophecy Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, you should take heed to the word of prophecy because here's what the word of prophecy is going to be. It's going to be like a light that shineth in a dark place and until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Faith is going to arise in your heart. Jesus is going to arise in your heart and you'll be able to be saved because faith cometh by hearing. That's what the verse is talking about. Look at verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Our King James Bible clearly is the more sure word of prophecy. When, compare, when you compare the source text, 5,309 manuscripts, 95 to 97% of them agree with each other. They're the majority text. They were compiled into the Textus Receptus. Every ancient Bible was translated from that Greek text. Every English Bible from Erasmus to the King James to the early 1800s, late, uh, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s was translated from that Textus Receptus received text versus the Westcott and Hort, minority, 3 to 5% of manuscripts that contradict each other 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. And I mean, we saw that. Contradicts itself, has errors. They put it together. They translated all modern Bible versions after the 1800s come from the Greek, Westcott and Hort, Greek manuscript. 
it becomes clear. Just looking at it logically, it becomes clear which one. You think for thousands of years when the, all the Bibles were Texas Receptus that we just went thousands of years without the Word of God? Till the 1800s, so Westcott and Hort came and gave us the Bible? You think, you think that God was just not working? That his Bible was just hidden somewhere in some monastery? That's ridiculous. Just looking at that should tell you which one is true. And just in case that doesn't convince you, or you're like, I don't know what that means. Okay, well, look, you should be able to just look at two verses side by side and realize, wow, these are not saying the same thing. Amen. One's attacking the Word of God. The other one's, one's affirming the deity of Christ. The other one's attacking the deity of Christ. One's affirming salvation by grace through faith, not of works. The other one's making it difficult and hard. One is giving the titles of Jesus to Satan, and one is honoring Jesus. It should be clear. It should be clear that we have a more sure word. And you know what? I hope this motivates you to get up tomorrow morning and read this Bible. Amen. Open it up and realize, wow, I, have, I literally have the words of God Amen. in my hands. I can trust Him. I can rely on Him. I can put my faith in Him. God wants to guide me with this. I don't have to worry about, is it true? Is it what the, uh, trans did the translators mess it up? Is that what God actually intended? This is what God intended for you and for me. This is the more sure word of prophecy. This is our heart and I want to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Bible. And Lord, thank you for uh, just the ability to be able to compare these and walk away and clearly see which one's real and which one's not. And Lord, for anyone who's maybe doubting it or still is not convinced, I pray they do their own research, Lord. But it's clear. It's clear that these modern Bible versions have an agenda. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to, to see that. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to just rely on the King James Bible. Lord, I pray that... that that tonight's sermon would help believers. I, I pray that there'd be no young person in this church tonight that would ever go to a church that's teaching out of a modern Bible version, that teaching out of a manuscript that's denying major Bible doctrines. Lord, we thank you for giving us your word. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen.